All right. So today's video is going to be four tips on how to make progressive overload work for you. Now, this was actually going to be eight tips. These are things that I've kind of garnered from conversations with clients over the last few weeks. Just been writing them down so that I can create a video uh, to help you guys. Because if these are conversations I'm having with my clients, then odds are somebody out there will find this useful as well. Um, I'm only going to cover four today because it'll get quite long if I cover everything. So I might do a follow up part two where I cover the other four. All right. But first, before we begin, yeah. So hit like, drop a comment for the algorithm. Let's promote the channel a little bit. It's moving in the right direction, actually. It's, it's going very well. So thank you for you guys and all the comments and everything are very much appreciated. And if you are interested in coaching, there's a link in the description. So I'm going to cover four points. The first point is understanding that hard training is a learned skill which you can improve on over time. Now, there, there's a lot of implications with this, right? So first of all, the ability to work hard is something you can improve on over the course of your training lifetime. So viewing training intensity as a skill, just like you would improving your backhand for tennis or improving your dribbling for, for football or soccer, those are skills. Now, when it comes to being able to push sets deeper and deeper, that's also a skill. Because with pushing sets deeper and deeper come the patience, the control, the breathing, the discipline to hold certain parts of your body still while others parts move, the mental disassociation. All of that is a skill. There's actually quite a lot that goes into advanced guys delving deep into a set. I mean, if you watch advanced guys train, most of the time they're not just screaming lunatics unless it's like um, Slick Rick. Most of the time, there's a lot of controlled focus going on because there's a lot going on. Not that you're consciously thinking about things, but deep within your subconscious, there's all kinds of stuff going on, all kinds of cues that you have to remember while still having the discipline to push hard. So working hard is a skill. It's not just related to effort. Now, on that note, what I typically find is the guys who are the most open to conversations around their training intensity tend to be guys who do better. So I, I am very open about my own training intensity. So I posted a video recently, a couple of days ago, regarding my leg day. And I fully admitted there was a couple of sets there where I held back on. I don't mind saying that. It, it doesn't bother me because I don't attach my self-worth to how hard I push my sets. And there was a reason why I held back on some of those sets. What I tend to find is the guys who get quite defensive about these things first of all they don't really do very well because they shut themselves off from advancing this is why it's super important this first point is is really important you will limit your progress if you don't acknowledge that training hard is a skill which you can improve on over time secondly those guys in my experience they don't tend to be doing very well upstairs i usually find either then or later on there's a lot going on in their lives so it kind of makes sense because if somebody feels like they're already stretched thin because of work, relationships, money, whatever, for them to then hear from somebody they respect that they're not trying hard enough, even though that's not what we're saying, it they might take it personally. Whereas hopefully what I've explained so far is the ability to work hard, it's literally a skill you're learning. Like if you were trying to learn and your backhand wasn't very good, and somebody said, look, we need to put some practice into that. You wouldn't burst out in tears. Like, okay, great. I need to practice my backhand. So it's a learned skill. And I think with a lot of people who are already mentally stretched thin, they take it as a moral assault or, or guys just new to lifting because they don't realize this key point, which is what I want you guys to understand. Training hard is a learned skill. You are not going to train as hard in your third year of lifting as you are in your 13th year if you do things correctly. You as a beginner benching 60 kilos, not, not you, but my audience is, is very intelligent and very emotionally detached. But, but, but a guy who benches 60 kilos, he's not going to go into the gym with Jordan Peters, who's an absolute lunatic, and try to pretend he's training as hard as Jordan. There's a certain degree of arrogance and hubris attached to that statement, you know? So the first thing, the first point is understand that your training intensity is a workable 
practicable, buildable thing, a skill. And also that it's not a moral judgment on you as a person. Okay, it's just something to improve on. Some days it's good, some days it's bad, but overall the trend should be it gets better and better. I mean, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but I certainly can. I look back on my years of lifting. There were certain sets which really upped the intensity for me. I remember the first time I squatted 160 kilos. This was back in Liverpool when I was at university, right? <laughs> I was stuck in the middle position for what was about five seconds. It was a brutal rep. I was doing a one rep max and I got it up to the midpoint, you know, where you just about get out of the bottom, but then, you know, you, you're, you're trying to complete and push your hips through. My God, I watched the video back and yeah, I was stuck for like five seconds. It was awful. But that, once I did that and I completed that rep, it switched something in on my brain. Well, okay, I can push that hard. Nothing bad's going to happen. And also when I encounter a bit of difficulty, I can keep pushing and pushing and I might make it. And one of the things I look for is this rep slowdown, but it's, it's more than that. It's more than that. It's also your willingness to push through a, a stall. When I got to the midpoint of that rep, I just kept pushing and pushing. I refused to die. And five seconds later, <laughs> I went up. Now, I'm not recommending you do that every session. But what I'm saying is that does switch something on in your brain. And you remember that. Your body remembers that. And you take it up to the next level. Maybe you guys will can relate. I, I'd like to hear some of your stories about the game-changing sets for you. But anyway, that's the first point. Understand that hard training is a learned skill. It can be improved on, and it's not a moral judgment on you. Second point is use the smallest possible increments when you are trying to progressively overload your sets. Yeah, strength isn't built in... 20 pound jumps, okay, or 10 kilo jumps. It's just not. Strength is typically built slowly. What I tend to do is I tend to get people to try and work with the smallest possible plates they can, just to make the progression a bit smoother. If you're jumping up by 10 kilos, well, you're going to have to do all kinds of things to make those sets work. So you're going to have to increase the rep range. You're probably going to have to loosen up your form a little bit just to accommodate that large increase. Whereas the smaller the increase, the less you have to employ all kinds of crazy tactics to actually jump up to that next level. You might lose a few reps, but basically it's a pretty smooth progression, just how double progression should be. This is also on a side note. This is also why I'm not a massive fan of dumbbells, typically. If you guys have ever seen my programs, you'll know I don't program in a lot of dumbbell work uh, for two reasons. One, it's quite hard to get dumbbells into position. So if you're doing dumbbell presses of any kind, I don't like wasting a lot of energy in getting dumbbells in a position. At my peak, I handled 70 kilo dumbbells, which is like 154 pounds in each hand. Those are very awkward to get into position. And there's a real danger of just messing something up when you sit down and lie down with the uh, dumbbells. No matter how careful you are, no matter how good your technique is, it can be dangerous. Then you've got to rely on getting spotters and uh, I just don't like it. But the other thing is dumbbells typically go up in two and a half kilo increments. So that's five kilos. It's a lot of weight. So generally, I'm not a huge fan of dumbbells. I think if you have to use dumbbells, and let's say you stall on a five to eight rep max on a dumbbell bench, and you've been at it for three or four sessions, you're just not moving anywhere. What I might do is I might get you to lower the weight and go to a higher rep range, um, 15 to 20, and progress from there. Now, just to give you some reasons why that works, an improvement on a five rep max dumbbell bench Let's say you want one more rep. That's a 20% improvement. If you think about it, five reps, 20% is one more rep. Now, an improvement of one rep on a 20 rep max is a 5% improvement. So just that alone should tell you it's easier to progress with the higher rep sets in terms of a percentage of improvement. So if you are stuck on dumbbells, a really easy tactic is just to increase the rep range. That works for all kinds of things. But as I say, typically, I'm mostly a fan of barbells, machines, cables over dumbbells for those two reasons. One, the increments, and two, the difficulty into getting them in position when you're pretty strong. Okay, third tip is avoiding injuries with progressive overload. This is something that commonly gets cited to say, look, I tried to progressive overload way I got injured, or I stagnated and I felt like I was gonna get injured. I think a lot of this is user error because people are trying to force progressive overload and get sloppy. 
That's what I see as a practical problem. So people will add reps and they'll be going along fine, adding reps, adding reps. But what they don't realize is to accommodate those extra reps, there's a slight form change. Maybe you cheat the weight a little bit. Maybe you adjust your position while you're pressing. Something happens to make the form inconsistent to allow you to do more reps. You're not actually getting stronger by virtue of getting stronger or getting bigger. You are just implementing minute cheating body positions to get more reps. Maybe there's a little bit more momentum coming out the bottom or just something, right? So the reps end up getting sloppier and sloppier. Now, if that's a tactic that you're employing, let's say you go up and wait, your reps get a bit sloppy and then you clean it up, then that's fine. I don't have a massive problem with that. But if you're not aware of it, it can lead to a situation where your reps get sloppier and sloppier and sloppier. And as a result, at some point, you're just not going to be able to improve because you're effectively working with what is a three to five rep max. And it's just very difficult to improve. I'll give you an example of this. Years ago, I, I was working in with a PT around here, a local PT, and uh, we were both doing the hammer incline seated press. And I was using about three and a half plates for a set of 15. He was also using three and a half plates, which I was quite surprised about because he's not anywhere near as big. And uh, we got to our top sets. Uh, he did two reps. And then he got his friend to force out four more reps. And he called that a set of six. I'm thinking, where do you go from there? Like realistically, where do you go from there? Is the next step to try and turn your two rep max into a three rep max? That's a difficult ask. Going from a two rep max to a three rep max, what is that? Like a month's worth of work? That's a huge improvement. 50% improvement. Or is he going to try and do more four reps? I just don't know where you go from there. You've gotten to the point where you've dug yourself into such a hole. You're not really doing a lot of effective work. You're just training at a very, very high percentage of your one at max. You're not really getting the adequate volume in to allow you to grow. It just doesn't work very well for growth. I think you need some clean reps. I think it's an ego thing or, or it's just people are mistaken. But that's an extreme example. What, what I'm saying is people do it more subtly. So they'll do little micro cheats and it'll get worse and worse over time, which can result in stagnation, but also it can result in injuries. So I think a lot of that is just people getting sloppy, but not realizing they're getting sloppy. For the sets to count, for progressive overload to really work, you have to remain consistent from week to week, from set to set. Now, on that note, third now, point four, and the final point for today, because this video is already getting quite long, this is related to the last two points. Keep an eye on your performance from say week one to week 12. And again, this is gonna be helped by being open to the idea of working harder, also recording your sets and be willing to get honest feedback from people. So keep an eye on performance. What I mean by that is four things. Firstly, range of motion. Now I'm not a stickler for a huge range of motion. Just be consistent. I find that a good range of motion works better for some areas like quads, in my experience, are very, very reliant on getting a, a high degree of knee flexion. But, but in general, I'm not a huge advocate of this extreme range of motion, which seems to be a trend at the moment. What I'm saying is get a good range of motion and keep it consistent. Consistency is important. Yeah. You want to make sure you're getting better week by week because you're getting better, not because you're cutting the range of motion and cheating more and all that kind of stuff, right? Keep it honest. If you lie to your logbook, you're only lying to yourself, yeah? Next thing is the speed of the sets and the speed of the reps. Now, very often when I'm trying to establish um, a set, what I'll do is I will count the negative. Typically speaking, like a three count negative. So one, two, three, and then back up. Now, in terms of how I count this in my head, this might be useful for you. Let's say you find it too much to do. You're counting your reps and you're counting your, your negative. Like maybe you find that too much. This is how I do it. You might find it useful. I don't know. So I go three, two, one, up, three, two, two, three, two, three, three, two, four. So simple, right? But that's how I do it. It just helps to keep me accountable and allows me to count my reps, but also count my negative seconds. All right. The next thing is pauses. So if you are using a pause, just keep it consistent. It's, it's, it's that simple. Let's say you're pausing at the bottom of a leg press. It's a good idea. Pause in the flex position. Great idea. 
keep it consistent. Don't go from pausing one week to say not pausing the next and consider that to be progress because it's not. And finally, when it comes to form and cheating, yeah, just try and keep it consistent. Yeah, keep an eye on performance from week one to week 12 in terms of range of motion, speed of your reps, pauses, and then also form and cheating. Don't just get better at cheating. To give you um, a really good example of this is people cheat quite a lot on rows. I'm not a fan of it, okay? But I think people employ a lot of excessive cheating on rows and they don't typically see the back development or the strength development as they would do if they were more strict. Now, those same people say that pull downs and chins are hard to do. So what is happening? In my view, pull downs are no harder than rows, but then I keep my back training strict. If you're cheating your rows, odds are you're not actually improving your back, which is why pull downs are hard because you can't cheat a pull down. Do you get what I'm saying? For those guys who cheat a lot in their rows, they're not actually improving week by week. They're just getting better at cheating. That's why they're not seeing gains in their pull downs. That's why pull downs are hard. So if they just cleaned up their form, they would be forced to get better. Like maybe they need to address their nutrition or something. But the reason they're not progressing in pull downs quite simply could be they're not actually progressing in any back area at all. They're just getting better at cheating their rows, but they can't cheat the pull downs. But anyway, that's a pretty common one that I see. But anyway, that was four tips. I will do a follow-up to this because I've got another four. Okay, yeah, just to wrap this up, hopefully you found that useful. Just some practical tips and some discussions that I've had with clients over the last couple of weeks, which I thought you guys would find quite useful. And if you are interested in hiring me as a coach, there's a link in the description. Peace out. Have a good one.